everybody. Thank you. You can be seated. It's so good to be here with my new family. Um, if you're the type likes following actual Bible, Leviticus 16, uh, we're going to get to that um, in, in just a second. If not, we've created some really easy to follow on with slides um, that, that you'll find that simple to, to carry on with. Um, after this is over, just one quick thing before um, we get going uh, with, with, I get to open the Bible tonight and I really like doing that. Um, on your way out, we do have a table set up uh, with uh, some of our resource store there. Um, everything's available in audio and video in USBs. Uh, and the reason we do that is because we live with a conviction that we're not simply called to go to heaven when we die. We're called to bring heaven to every place we see hell here. And so we use the profit from that to help create a fund that helps us do mission in the world. Our mission of choice are to take care of children with mental and physical disabilities in China. We have three homes, two in Hinyang, one in Changsha. And so there's six new ones since last time I was here. I just finished a, a two six-part series on the, uh, on the life of Jesus. I also did, I preached through the entire book of, taught through the entire book of Romans, the entire book of Genesis. All that's out there. Also, um, I got too embarrassed for words for what particularly Pentecostals were putting on the internet about the book of Revelation. And so I decided, instead of arguing with them, to just teach through it and go, okay, let the better narrative win out there. Um, so that's out there. The, the only thing I would ask is if you don't want anything, God bless you. Uh, I'll see you next year um, when I come by. Um, if you do want something, um, would you come by in the first five minutes, please? Uh, the reason is, is because um, I've got to tear it down and take it to Dubbo with me tomorrow, all right? So I'm in, I'm in Dubbo tomorrow and then Orange on Tuesday and then Bathurst on Wednesday and then I gotta be in West Sydney on Thursday and then fly back up and speak in Brisbane Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I gotta take it. So if you don't mind, if you would, uh, the, the fulfillment of scripture is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so if, if you would be, uh, if you don't want anything, honestly, I've no, nothing but blessing for you. But if you want something, if you could buy first and chat second, that would be awesome. Uh, we also have a, we have a web stream app now that uh, just got released five weeks ago. Uh, the QR code will be out there. You could just click on it and do the thing you do with a QR code and uh, set up a free profile and uh, then you'd have access. What's out there is probably 20% of our resource library. Uh, that would give you access to the rest of it. All right, so, uh, so you could pick that up. All right, so I get to open the Bible tonight. I love doing that, right? I take this very seriously. Anytime I do that, I want Jesus to get bigger, the cross to work better, the resurrection to be central, and scriptures to get bigger, not smaller. I have a few goals tonight. I'm just gonna be upfront with you about it. Um, my goals are that by the end of tonight, um, you'll at least have some sort of wording and empowerment around how to handle regret, uh, how to handle your own regret, how to handle other people's regret. Um, I hope that we understand uh, the story of Jesus even better. I hope that's gonna happen. And I hope we understand the power of celebration, all right? So, so we're gonna talk about that. I wanna talk to you about how to handle regret tonight. Um, I think that's something that everybody should perk up, right? Because it applies to everybody. Like if I, if I was to say, I wanna talk to you about parenting, um, some of you like, oh, what's he gonna say? Others be like, oh, whatever, my kids are 30, right? Um, if I was this, there, most topics... Most topics have a certain niche sort of thing, not regret. Regret's one of those things that you should not, should unite us all, all right? If we're, if we're honest, we all have planks in our eyes, right? And, um, and the people who are the most refreshing realize that, right? We, we, when I say, I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about those things, I'm talking about those things in your life that you pray to God never end up on Facebook. <laughs> that. I, I'm talking about those things in your life that when you, when you meet a new group of people, you struggle on the inside about how much of your story to tell. Because it was 10 years ago, if they found out, they might think less of you, but if you're too open, they might shame you up front for something that's been gone. That. I'm talking about what do you do with your regret? Now, this is, uh, this is a question that uh, cultures have struggled with for centuries. Um, thank God we don't live in ancient Sumerian culture. In ancient Sumerian culture, you had to cut yourself until it rained. That's how you knew that your regret had been handled with the gods. Um, in, in, in the Middle Ages, there were monks that wrote in their diaries, I prayed on my knees on stone floors until they bled which leads to all kinds of questions like, what kind of God do you actually think you're serving that would glorify in your physical pain just for him to be nice to you? Strange, the things we do. 
It's weird. If, you, if you're honest, whether you realize it consciously or not, all of us psychologically have some sort of ritual we do to cathart our regret so that we can then make ourselves feel better. Um, some eat whole packages of Tim Tams. <laughs> That's your ritual. I'll have an entire pavlova, thank you. Some. Some shop their regret away. Some inflict pain on themselves unnecessarily. Have you ever been around somebody and, and they tell a story that's 16 years old, but their emotions are still like it happened yesterday? And everything in you wants to say, come on, bro, let's move forward. Come on, sweetie, let's move forward. But Shane, they left me, I know, seven years ago. They probably did you a favor. Let's move on, right? But then again, you don't want to have the just move on thing right up front either because that, that, that doesn't acknowledge the pain and the suffering. Um, to intellectualize suffering, it, it, de it, it devalues the suffering and the sufferer. Right. Suffering is not something to be intellectualized. Suffering is something to profoundly trust in the middle of. And so we got that. So I started thinking about this topic. We all have regrets. And what is something helpful that can help us deal with our regrets. And, and to me, one of the most ancient answers is still maybe the best one. He, here's what happened. In the book of Leviticus, here's what God did. He set aside one day every year. That day was called Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And I, this will be oversimplified, but let me just, I, I'm, I'm gonna try, right, to, you, you don't want the real complicated version, no one does, but, but, but it was, it, think about it this way. It was one day a year that you set aside to let it go, to start over, to get a fresh start, a second chance, an opportunity to write a better story from this point forward. It was that if I could use, um, if I could use a bucket as an illustration, if, if as you live through your year, um, there are things we will do that will fill this bucket of regret up. And some people's buckets are overflowing and some people's buckets aren't so much, but, but whatever. We all have, we all carry around the weight of stuff and there's a neurobiological reason why we focus on it. Um, it, it takes less than a 10th of a second for a negative experience to imprint on your brain. That same, a same experience being positive has to be remembered on purpose for 16 seconds to have the same imprint on the brain. So we have no trouble. If you make 100 decisions in a day and 99 are good and one is bad, what will you go to bed thinking about? The one that's bad. And that's a biological gift from God, by the way, for us to mark the things that cause pain so we avoid them later. That's the idea. But, but you, you got this bucket. And, and here's, here's what Yom Kippur was. Yom Kippur was one day a year, we're gonna set aside a day where God empties our bucket. And the most simple way to think of it is, you can't take this year's bucket into next year. You can't take this year's bucket of regret into the next season's bucket. Because next year will have its own bucket. And, and, and what happens is, is, if you don't regularly have a ritual or something that helps you free the weight of past regret, next year you have two buckets. And then the next year you have three. And then you have to consolidate it into a barrel. And if, if you carry regret too long, one day you'll need a crane to pick up your life. So, so the oldest revelation of the grace of God was one day a year, one day a year, you set it aside and you empty your bucket. Um, now, a, a later writer said actually his mercy's new every morning. And a later writer recorded that Jesus said, forgive 70 times seven for the same sin in the same day. So if you, can't, if you can't go with Jesus, I get that. That's really excessive grace and love and kindness and compassion. But at least go back to forgiving yourself once a day. And if you can't forgive yourself once a day, at least go back to forgiving yourself once a year. And if, you, if your concept of God is meaner than Leviticus, it's probably time to change. So I, I want to I wanna, I wanna read you about this day, and I want to point out that one, just one, one of the ways the gospel writers frame the meaning of Jesus was through a Yom Kippur ceremony. So I want to read you the passage, and then I want to take you through a Yom Kippur ceremony, 
and uh, show you where the gospel writers were going. If you wanna know what Jesus means, this is the person by which God is gonna let all of our offenses go. Um, This is Leviticus 16. Um, You can bring that up on the screens. Um, Aaron is to offer the bull for his own for his own sin as an offering, to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other for the scapegoat. So this day centered around two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Next slide. So let's talk about these two goats. This is an oversimplification, but basically you would cast lots and one lot would fall to the Lord. That's the goat for the Lord. It's gonna be a bad day for that goat, okay? But let's just be honest. If you're born a goat, it's a bad day, period, right? (laughs) The other goat was called the scapegoat. That's the English word. Uh, The the translation is weird. Uh, And to be fair, the Hebrew word is so strange, there's not a real good equivalent. The Hebrew word is azazel. Now, this is the most important word I'm gonna teach you tonight. So with some go Melbourne gusto, whatever AFL team you cheer for, I want us to try to say it. It just sounds like this, azazel. Ready, go. Azazel. You know, that's a perfect amount of energy. I like that. Ready, let's try that again. Ready, go. Azazel. Now, in English, they translate it scapegoat. In the Afrikaans Bible, they don't really have an equivalent word, so they just keep it azazel. Right? Uh, but because it's actually a verb that's being pronounced like a noun. So strange. Azazel means take him away. Away with him. If you're an, if you're an X-Men fan, um, the, the, in the comic strip X-Men, one of the villains in the X-Men comics is called Azazel. And his member, his gift is he could just grab people and take them away. He just takes them away. Um, it, it can also be a weapon in the hand of the enemy. In other words, Azazel was to take away the thing that the enemy beats you up with, which is normally your own failures. Normally, we don't need people piling on. Um, Our own failures on the inside are beating us up enough. So so the idea of Yom Kippur is we're going to remove the weapon that the enemy uses to beat you up. And that, that word is Azazel, and it means Take him away. Now, it's going to be really important in a little bit. So let's say that together. It just sounds like this. Take him away. Ready? Go. Take him away. So this day centers around two goats. One goat for the Lord and the other. What was his name? Everybody together. Azazel. And it means take him away. Here it goes. Ready? Next slide. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it away into the desert as the Azazel. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to take you through a very, very basic Yom Kippur ceremony. And I'm going to show you where the gospel writers, one of the ways they were framing the meaning of Jesus was through this ceremony. So first, this day centered around two goats. One, the goat for the Lord. The other, the goat for Azazel, which means take him away. The goat for the Lord. So what they would do is they would take the goat into, um, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, keep going. Yeah, there we go. The goat for the Lord. The goat for the Lord would be taken into this altar area. And they would strap him down. Now, the first thing they would do is once they strapped this goat down is they would do something called the laying on of hands. The Hebrew word is mala. Now, Words matter less than how we picture words working, okay? So when I say we're gonna lay hands on somebody, for most of us in the Western world who are literalist, we just go, right, and fine, right? But the actual, the root word laying on of hands doesn't necessarily mean to touch someone. It means to impart something that's within your authority to impart over somebody. So you could lay hands on someone without touching them. Uh, matter of fact, rabbis did it all the time. Rabbis would not have touched sick people, but they certainly laid hands on them, right? It's, it's, like, it's like, wait a minute, I'm gonna give you. A silver and gold I don't have, but I'm gonna give you. So that's my law. And in this situation, the priest is empowered with the authority to put everybody's regrets on this goat. It's kind of like this. Everybody bring your bucket. Everybody's got your bucket of regret. Everybody's owning your stuff. We're not hiding it today. We're not covering it up. No, 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 we are owning our regret. This is the plank 
in my eye. And we would take all those buckets and we would put it on this goat. And he would pray a prayer to put all the sins on the goat. The Talmud says that the pressure of this moment on the priest would force the priest to turn his head. So it would look like this. Hang on, the the gospel writers said that when Jesus was on the cross, the sins of the whole world were placed upon him. And who turned his head? God the Father turned his head. This is a Yom Kippur reference. It's like, is this the day God just lets it all go? Is this happening right in front of us? Mala. The second thing was called the press. What the, what the priest would do after he malad is he'd lay on the goat and squeeze him. He'd reach around and squeeze. And the goat would be like, ah, right? It's, it's that, the idea is we really, really need to get the sins in the goat. It's that, it's that. The, the play on words, though, is the Hebrew word press is Gethsemane. So Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And remember his prayer? What does he pray? Father, I'm pressed with the sins of the world. Once the press was done, at exactly the ninth hour, the priest would proclaim in a loud voice, it is finished. And he would take a knife and he would cut the goat's throat. At exactly the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. This is Yom Kippur language. This is like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is, is, Is this the day God just lets it all go? The the priest would then catch the goat's blood in this cone-shaped cylinder, broad at the top, near at the bottom. The reason is there was this law about the blood having to stay alive. So it had to stay warm. And so what they would do is they would catch the blood in this cone-shaped cylinder and he'd swirl it to keep it moving and alive. He'd swirl it like this and he'd walk from the altar to the Holy of Holies saying, don't touch me, don't touch me. I have not yet offered the blood of the sacrifice. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I have not yet offered the blood of the sacrifice. Hold on. The gospel writers say that after all these things, Jesus ran into two people in a garden and he doesn't say hello. What does he say? Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I have not yet ascended. This is Yom Kippur language. Is this the day God just lets it all go? That the priest would then go into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle blood on the altar seven times. Different sermon for a different day. He would sprinkle blood on the altar seven times. He would then come out and he would be a bloody mess from this entire ordeal. And what he would do is he would then wash his hands in this basin and present his hands for inspection that he was actually still flesh and blood and he survived the whole idea. The idea was, the idea was if you survive going in there, God has accepted this entire thing and our regrets are gone, but they would inspect his hands. Hold on a second. The gospel writers say after all these things, Jesus appeared to people in the upper room and what's the first thing he did? He offered his hands for inspection. This is Yom Kippur language. Is is this the day God just lets it all go? The the mala, Gethsemane, it is finished. Don't touch me, inspect my hands. But this day doesn't center around one goat. This day centers around two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other one, what was his name, everybody together? Azazel, and that name means take him away. So after the goat for the Lord, uh, there was the goat for Azazel. Here's the account of that, Leviticus 16. Bring that next slide up for me. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he should then bring forward the live goat. The live goat is Azazel. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat. Mala. And confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins. Now, I went and looked that word up in Hebrew, and the word all there is actually all. Because when all says all, let's leave all, all, because if all doesn't mean all, then we run the risk of our sin not being in all. So let's quit, make, let's quit making exceptions to the word all, because all means all, and let's leave it all. So when it says all, let's leave it all, because all means all. But Shane, you don't know what I did. I do. I do, I know it fits into the category of all. All, all the buckets 
We're going to put it on the goat's head, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. So they attach the sins to the goat's head. I'll show you how they do it in a second. He shall, he shall then send the goat away. There it is. Take him away into the desert in the care of a man appointed to the task. So with the Azazel, somebody has to be put in charge of the Azazel in order to remove the scapegoat. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it into the desert. The man who releases the goat as the Azazel must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterwards, he may come into the camp. So this day centers around two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other for the Azazel, the goat for the Lord. Mala, it is Gethsemane, it is finished. Don't touch me, present the hands. Now the goat for Azazel. They have the live goat and he's standing in front of all these people. Yom Kippur was the holiest day of the year. As a matter of fact, it's the only day where the command is Shabbat Shabbaton absolutely no work. It's the one day of the year that you're not allowed to do anything. Why? Because God is going to forgive everybody's regrets on this day. And if anybody's allowed to do anything, one day they'll make their thing the ritual by which forgiveness comes. And you can't have that. Because if you have that, you'll have people doing it, people not doing it, people in, people out. And then the people who are in are going to label the people out, out, and then justify mistreating them. That is could not be. So God gets out in front of it and says, actually, on the day I choose to forgive everybody's sins, no work. Absolutely no one can do anything. That way no one can say it's because of what they did. God forgave them. It's that. And so this live goat is standing in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people with nothing else to do. And they've all brought their bucket of regret. And they're all waiting to know that they get a fresh start for their new year. That they get a fresh start. Yom Kippur was on the 10th day of the new year. And it followed all of these rituals and stuff. The days of all, the Feast of Trumpets. I don't want to bore you with all that. But it was basically the last day of celebration of the new season that was coming. And it was an acknowledgement and an invitation to let all the bucket go over here. So that you can start fresh in the new year and walk into your new season with confidence and a fresh start and a second chance and a clean slate and an opportunity to write a better story for your life. So this live goat is terrified. He knows what just happened to his best friend in there and he's out in front of everybody. Now here's what would happen with the live goat. The first thing they would do, it just says it right there in Leviticus 16, is they would mala. Next slide. So it follows kind of the same thing, but with different. Mala, the laying on of hands. In other words, everybody bring your bucket. Everybody got it? Everybody got your bucket? I'm going to put it on this live goat. In this day, here's what happened. The goat for the Lord takes care of everything in private. But God knows that people don't tend to believe things they can't see. So the live goat was meant to show you in public what the goat in private had accomplished. That's exactly how the New Testament writers present Jesus, that he accomplished everything before the foundation of the world, but you would not believe it without seeing it. So in his time, he showed us what was true about God all along. This is Yom Kippur sort of language. So the priest would put all the sins onto this live goat, and they would illustrate it by putting it on the goat's head. The way they would do that is they would take a scarlet woolen thread, a red cord, and they would wrap it around the goat's head. And then he would back off and say, behold, Israel, your sin. Behold, Israel, your sin. Behold, Israel, your sin. Hang on a second. The gospel writers say that a part of Jesus' trial, Pilate has his head wrapped in thorns and then stood in front of the Jewish crowd. Hold on a second. If you wrap a man's head with thorns, what color would the wrapping be? Red. This is Yom Kippur language. Is this the day? The Jesus story is the Lamb of God standing in front of the Jewish crowd with red wrapping wrapped around his head. Then they had to put someone in charge of the Azazel. Remember what Jesus said to Pilate? You've been given charge over me by heaven. The person who's in charge of the Azazel would then cut a piece of the red cord off and he would hang it from the temple door. And then he would do something called the march through the crowd. 
And so they would take the live goat and he would march him through this massive crowd of people with all kinds of regret. And they'd be ridiculing the, the, the Azazel. They'd be taking out their frustrations on the Azazel. And he's walking him through the crowd and he's saying this, Behold, Israel, your sin has been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Behold, Israel, your sin is being removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Behold, Israel, your sin is being removed from you as far as the east is from the west. He would then take the goat into the desert. Now, this took a while. I've been to the place where this would happen. So you would take the goat. It would go past 10 stations. They'd wave flags. And no one's allowed to do anything while this is going on. So it's like... What they started to do to make it a little easier is they started to take the goat to a nearby cliff and just throw him off the cliff, right? Now, now the reason is, is that logistically was easier to do. Also, the Mishnah tells us that there was one Yom Kippur, that three days after Yom Kippur, the scapegoat found his way back home, right? <laughs> and so everybody's regrets returned, right? And it was like, oh, by the way, uh, uh, by the way, that's the etymology of the phrase. Remember your grandmother? If you ever did something dumb and your friends were taking the mickey out of you, what did your grandmother tell you? Don't let them get your goat. Don't let them get your goat. That, don't let them get your goat is a metaphor for bringing up someone's failure, bringing up someone that would, something that would embarrass them. It's, it's, it's actually shaming people with stuff that's been far, far, far gone. It's, it's, actually, it's actually, and by the way, um, at, at Numa Church, we want to be a church of goat removers, never goat bringers, right? Like you don't wanna, you don't wanna become the weapon in the hand of the enemy that God has removed. That, that, would be, that, that, would be pretty, that would be pretty bad. This is the problem when, when people bring up someone's failure from 15 years ago and say, you didn't know about that? Hold on a second. That's goat bringing, not goat removing, right? And so, and so they, would, they would take the goat into the desert. And people just had to kind of stand around because they weren't allowed to do anything. No singing, no dancing, no clapping, Pentecostals would have been highly uncomfortable, <laughs> just kind of, they're getting the goat around, you know? The, 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 the priest is the only one allowed to do anything, and he's doing boring stuff like shoveling the ashes of the red heifer and things like this. And the, the, the Yom Kippur, though, um, the Talmud says that every year on Yom Kippur, the same miracle happened. Well, what would happen is once the goat had been removed or thrown off the cliff, um, the red cord that was hanging from the temple door would turn white. It was this like, um, it was like this cosmic sort of God sign that, hey, it worked. I accepted what was in there. I accepted what was in here. Everybody gets a clear bucket. Everybody gets a clean slate. Everybody gets a fresh start. Everybody gets the opportunity to write a better story. Can you imagine for a second, be emotional for a second. Can you imagine the feeling in that place when you realize that that entire bucket was gone and you get a fresh start to write a different story? Could you imagine the general feeling across the place, it would have been a buzz, like, yeah. right? Here's the problem, what's the problem? You're not allowed to do anything. So it would be, you know, like just this buzz because you're not allowed to do anything until the priest ends it. And Yom Kippur ends when the priest notices that the cord had turned white. And it ends with this very basic move. When the priest noticed the cord turned white, there was a chair up where everybody could see and the priest would back up to that chair and simply sit down. And when the priest sat down, it was the indication to the people, it's all done. Everybody's got a clean bucket. Everybody's got a fresh start. Every, don't take this year's bucket into next year. Don't do that. No, no, no. Everybody's got a clean slate. And now they're allowed to do something. And I'm trying to think of the Hebrew word for this. They went nuts. Why? Because when you get a revelation that God is not holding your regrets against you as much as you're holding your regrets against you, that is freedom. It's like, to use an agricultural example, it's like if all the bad seeds you had planted got dug up and now you get a fresh start to plant different seeds. Now, if you use that opportunity and keep behaving the same way, 
that's dumb, right? Is, is God faithful to forgive you? Yes, every time, but your life will stink to high heaven. You can be a forgiven person that chooses to continue to ruin their life. That is different. Redemption is free. Reputation is not. That's two different things. But this was this once a year opportunity where God says, hey, think of your whole life as a bare field. And the next year, it's your choice of what seed you sow. It's your choice to do something different with it. It's your choice to do those things. This was Yom Kippur. Um, there's a, there's a, I love this, um, this is a, an old, very old eyewitness testimony of someone who witnessed a Yom Kippur and then wrote down their feelings. Now, um, this is translated into very old, like King James English, so please excuse that, but it's just really, really powerful in the emotion of it. This is a one person's experience with their Yom Kippur. He then fastened a scarlet woolen thread to the head of the goat for Azazel. And laying his hands upon it again, recited the following confession of sin and prayer for forgiveness. Oh, Lord, I've acted with iniquities, trespasses, and sins before you. I, my household, the sons of Aaron, your holy ones. Oh, Lord, forgive the iniquities, transgressions, and sins that I, my household, the Aaron and Aaron's children, your holy people, commit before you. As it is written in the law of Moses, your servant, for on this day he will forgive you to cleanse you from all your sins before the Lord, and you will be clean. This is Yom Kippur, which leads me to Easter. We just celebrated Easter, like the Super Bowl, the grand final of the Christian calendar. Easter reminds us something. Like there's, there's two ditches to avoid with how we approach our faith. One ditch is to say that death gets no word. There's no room for suffering and grief and doubt and pain and death. That's not Christianity. That doesn't fit anybody's experience. The Easter story reminds us that death certainly gets a word. Suffering surely gets a word. Doubt certainly gets a word. Grief certainly gets a word. It just doesn't get the last word. The the last word is not despair. It's resurrection. It's the opportunity to write something different. It's that. And so in the Easter story, there's all these unique things. And everybody in this room would know something about the Easter story. Probably most people have seen the Passion of the Christ once, right? Right? Nobody just watches it again, like it's weird. Or you've seen some sort of passion play, but it's very famous. Even the children, if they do a little Easter play, it's in all of them. It's in all the movies. It's, it's, in, it's in all of it, right? And this is what happens, right? Pilate's in a conundrum, and he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't want to hurt Jesus, but he doesn't want to riot either. It's a problem. And he says to the people, what do you want me to do with him? And they chant something famous. It's very famous. What do they chant? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Here's the problem. That's not what they said. Check John out here. Check this out. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here's your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Hang on a second. If a bunch of Jews are shouting, take him away, what word are they saying? Azazel, 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 Azazel. Is this the day God just lets it all go? But, but hold on, in Leviticus it says someone has to be put in charge of the Azazel. Remember Jesus said, you've been given charge over me? And it says after the person in charge of the Azazel is done with the Azazel, what must he do? He has to wash his hands. This is Matthew, check this out. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. Is this the day God just lets it all go? But but hold on a second. Yom Kippur ends with a specific move. It ends when the priest sits. Hebrews chapter 10 Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. In other words, you got a standing priest, you got more stuff to do. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he is now sat down at the right hand of God. The message of the New Testament is our priest is sitting. Which leads me to this question. Have we ever presented the gospel in a way that makes Jesus stand back up? 
Now, trust us, Jesus. We have this ritual we need everybody to do so that we can control them with their religious guilt. Don't worry about it, right? The, the only time in the New Testament you see Jesus standing is when they stone Stephen. In other words, if you're going to still act like this, what have I done? The New Testament picture is our priest is sitting. Here's 1 John. This is a guy that was there. Here's his take on it. Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Pause. The only appropriate response to the grace of God is to choose to live better. If you keep showing up every year with the same exact bucket of regrets, you will hate your life. Will God forgive you every year? Yes, but your life will stink to high heaven. Absolutely. You can't show up every year with the same bucket of regret. God will be faithful to forgive you, but your life will stink. The only appropriate response to God giving us grace and second chances is to choose to live better. Like if you break the law and a clever lawyer gets you off, stop breaking the law. If you fail a test and the teacher knows you just weren't at your best that day and they give you a do-over on the test, write different answers. If you hit a golf shot and they were talking in your backswing and you hit it in the water and they say, oh, sorry, we were talking in your backswing. Have another one. Aim differently. If you write a story and that story is embarrassing to you and that story somehow gets erased and you're given a clean slate, write a different story. Dear children, it is dumb to presume upon the grace of God to simply forgive us and then not take advantage of the opportunity to write a better story for our life. Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But he keeps going. Dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, I love that. Dear children, I hope you don't. But if you do, and you will, We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. There's that Yom Kippur motive. And not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Like, we didn't think Jesus just does this for us, right? Because then that would allow us to label people and then justify mistreating them. And that would be terrible. One Christ holding us all together, offering us the same grace. The question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with that opportunity? Dear children, dear children, I hope you don't. Now, they say great teachers can summarize big sermons in one sentence. I need four. (laughs) So in case you tuned out, and now you can feel it coming to a close, you can come back now and get the whole sermon in three minutes for our TikTok generation. (laughs) Here's the whole sermon in four sentences. Number one, the hands have been washed. Yeah, but Shane, you don't know what I did. You know, I don't. Dear children, please stop doing that. It's ruining your life and the consequences are gonna be there. But the good news is better than that failure. The good news is that the hands have been washed. I need my musicians back. Let me just say it this way. The the other way to say it may be this way. The cord has turned white. But Shane, you understand, I keep doing the same. It's this lust And I know Jesus told me it would bring hell to my life, but the computer is there and it's free and it has no accountability and it just calls to me and I hate it. I feel lonelier than ever before, every single time. And I just can't stop. I know, I know. Dear children, I hope you take this as an opportunity to be empowered to live a better life. But the good news is better than that failure. The good news is the cord has turned white. Maybe we could say it this way. Next one. The priest has sat down. Oh, but Shane, I've messed up far too much. What, too much for Jesus? Seriously, in what way are we thinking about the gospel in a way that makes Jesus stand back up? The good news is better than that failure. The good news is the priest is sitting. But maybe the best way we can remember today is simply this. The goat has left the building. Azazelbis has left the building. 
Oh, but Shane, you understand, I went through a divorce. I know, I know, dear children, I'm so sorry you went through that pain. But the good news is better than that story. The good news is your goat has left the building. But Shane, it was totally my fault. I know, I know. And please take this as an opportunity to write a better story and not engage in those behaviors from this day forward. But the good news is better than that. The good news is that your goat has left the building. But Shane, I'm an addict. Seriously, it's so hard. I can't stop. I know, I know. Dear children, please take this as an opportunity not to justify destructive behavior, but to engage in life. Please stop doing drugs. You'll never meet a 45-year-old addict that's enjoying it. Take this opportunity to turn your life around now. But the good news is better than that failure. It's never despair. It's never you're too far to turn around. The good news is better than that. The good news is your goat has left the building. And there's a couple ways I could end tonight. One way, neither are wrong, One way is to have an altar call. And here's what that would look like if you're carrying regret and you want to leave that and you want someone to believe with you, to be empowered to leave that. I want to invite you up here right now and we're going to pray for you. That's one way. Um, It's not wrong. I just don't want to do it that way. Frankly, because it takes too long and I don't want to deal with all the snot. That's right. It also kind of cuts across the spirit of Yom Kippur. The spirit of Yom Kippur is not come up here and be so sorry that God acts. Yom Kippur is, I am so amazed God acted in entirely out of grace that I can't help but celebrate. And here's what's gonna happen here in a few seconds, okay? Here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna enter into celebration. And I mean raucous celebration. Now, i got to be careful because you got to define things. You tell a group of people, we're going to go nuts. i got to be honest. White people don't know what that means. Right? All my white brothers and sisters in the room, they're like, oh, God. What? White people can't even dance with their feet. They just dance with their shoulders. It's like, hey. Hey. And it gets frankly awkward, right? And we're not Jewish, so we're not blowing horns. None of us are that good at it anyway. So I'm gonna pick a language of celebration that everybody can do without being embarrassed. Like if I said, we're gonna shout now, that's awkward for some people. All the introverts are like, shout, oh. Right? It's just weird. I don't want to be weird. But there's, there's a language of celebration that everybody can do and we're all comfortable with. And that's clapping. And it's clapping on beat in unison, which is also important. But, but let, me, let, me, let me explain clapping. Like you don't want somebody, right? right? There, there's, a way, there's a way that you can clap. Everybody still with me? There's a way you can clap that it's like mindless. But in in Hebrew, when hands come together, it means agreement. It's this, uh, what do you call it, camaraderie, that all together, we're agreeing, not just for me, but for everybody in this room, that they'll be released from the pain of the darkness that they've caused, and then not just that, be empowered to do something different, otherwise it just comes back. Um, Clapping, like, think about it, handshake agreements. That means we agree. Or, or in the AFL, your team scores and you do a high, a high five. So when, when people, when hands come together, it's this, no, no, we agree together. So here's what's going to happen. I want everybody to stand. This is part of the sermon. I want everybody to leave you know, and everybody stand. It's just going to, it's not going to be long. I don't do long, okay? Um, so this is what we're going to do. Okay, in just a second. We're, we're going to come. And, and here's what's going to happen. The shame, the pain, the guilt, the divorce, the addiction, the, the, the crime, the, the whatever it is that you haven't been able to let go. There's going to be a sense of freedom in this place that it is going to burst you open. Here's what's going to happen corporately and individually. Individually, 
We're gonna be set free, but corporately, we're also gonna be set free to walk into new seasons with fresh starts, second chances, opportunities to write a better story. We're gonna put different seeds in the ground. So I want you, I don't even, I can't remember the name of the song y'all picked, but could you hit that beat hard as you can? Right, just hit that beat. Oh, yeah, yeah. 